Away we go. Acts chapter 28. The last chapter of the book of Acts. And uh, for those of you that might see this as a recording, make sure you come to... It. Nothing I can do about the teacher up here, but if I lose your attention at the beginning of this or middle of this, at least watch the last third of this because it's a bit of a summation of, of Acts and why it's important. Of course... Uh, you know, and why it's important, and the transitions, plural, that occur over the time from Acts chapter 1 up into Acts 28. But we're going to see definitely, you know, here in Acts 28, that it is still Jew first. You know, the people that want to say Acts chapter 7 is where the Jews fell, you know, they were falling, but that they did not fall yet. And that will be very evident in Acts 28. So with that, let's just go ahead and start reading Acts chapter 28, the last chapter in the book of Acts. And when they were escaped, and of course, just to, since last week we were all down with Brother Jerry, uh, if you remember the shipwreck in Acts 27, you know, they, they, uh, you know, they had the, the shipwreck. Let's go back to verse 44 of chapter 27 even. Let's pick up the last verse. And the rest some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. Okay, so they get to land, but I mean, as we talked about, literally on pieces of the ship. So verse 28, And when they were escaped, and they knew that the island was called uh, Melita, or Malta is what it is today. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received, every, and received us every one because of the present rain. And because of the cold. Alright, so they're going to help warm these people up, right? So they're, they're being very helpful to Paul and the other prisoners there and the guards. Verse 3, And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened onto his hand. Yes, a snake. Okay, a viper. A snake jumps right out of that fire and grabs hold of him. Verse 4, And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast, Hanging on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire, and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen, or fallen down dead suddenly, but after they had looked a great while, and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds, and said that he was a god. Okay, it's still the program that was going on back there in the book of Acts and while Christ was on earth even. Okay, keep your hand here, come back to Mark chapter 16. Got different colors on today. Voice is turning the right direction. <laughs> Just turn in the right direction. Back in Mark 16. Yeah, Mark. So if we go to our timeline, you know, Genesis through, Mal Genesis through Malachi, the Old Testament, the birth of Christ, and we had Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John describing, I'm going to say this 33-year 30, period, but for the most part, it's about a a three-year period, maybe even a tad less, that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are describing. Okay, the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ on earth starting when he turned 30. Okay, and when he got baptized, when he was 30. Yes, water baptized at 30 to wash away his original sin, right? Okay, obviously no. All right, he had to have lived a sinless life, and that's why it was important that that he was born of a virgin, so he did not have an earthly father's blood in him. Otherwise, he would have had original sin. He had the blood from God the Father. Okay, that's why his blood was sinless. So anyway, the point is, most of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John start when Christ is 30 until his crucifixion and his, his, his death, his burial, his resurrection. Some will even go into his ascension 40 days later. But that's the extent of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then the book of Acts picks up. All right. Mark 16. Passage that many people use this morning, being a Sunday morning. Verse 16. 
Actually, start in verse 15. And, so including what he said before this, actually start in 14. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. So he is with who? The eleven. You always got to get the context. He's with the eleven, not with lots of peas. With the eleven. Verse 15. And he said unto them. Who's them? The eleven. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Okay, so he's speaking to the eleven. This is their charge. I mean, in a few more verses here, we're going to have the end of the book of Mark. He's charging the eleven what they're to do. Okay, and many people this morning are going to be taking this to everybody. Okay, this is to the eleven. Uh, and preach, verse 15, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And most people stop right there. Verse 17 starts with the words, and. That means and. Okay? In addition to. Not only that, but this also goes with it. This that we're about to read in verse 17, 18. 17, and. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues, as the apostles do about 50 days later at the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, they speak with tongues. Verse 18, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Clear to the end of the book of Acts. There's Paul. A serpent jumps up and grabs him you know, by the arm, bites him, and all those natives of that island are waiting for Paul to drop over dead, and he doesn't. Mark 16, 16. The program has not yet been done, done away with, let's put it that way. That program has not yet ended. We're a chapter away from that program totally going away until after the rapture of the church and the seven-year trip comes back into place, it'll come back. But right now, it's on hold. The laying of hands is also... <coughs> Absolutely. The laying on hands, the speaking of tongues. But I mean, as far as referring to 18 here, we'll see it in chapter yes. 28. A okay, yeah, absolutely. For healings, absolutely. They're on hold as well. They will all come back in the seven-year period of Great Tribulation. Okay, but for right now, they are set aside. We're in a different dispensation. So, 18. Uh, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Healings. Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 5. Paul. As a matter of fact, we're going to see Paul do some healings in, in Acts 28. Uh, when we get back to Acts 28 this morning, we're going to see him do some healings. All right, and they're going to bring people to him to be healed. Okay, that has not yet been done away with. But at the end of Acts 28, it will. When the Jews go, lo am I, not my people. Okay, so you're going to see that in a minute. But I just want to come back. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ, His parting words here in the book of Mark. Uh, let's just finish it out, and then we'll come back to Acts 28. So 18 again. Mark 16, 18. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. There's the signs again. Amen. And the end of the book of, of Mark. Okay? So that's just setting up. That was the program when Christ ascended. So we know... You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is all about the Lord Jesus Christ teaching and preparing 12 men for a future uh, ministration, for a future uh, ministry. And, of course, that is out here in the future. These 12 men are going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel during the thousand-year reign. Okay, that's why the first thing they do in the book of Acts, you remember in Acts chapter 1, they had to select a 12th apostle to replace Judas Iscariot, who hung himself, and remember Matthias, 
was the one that took his place so that there would be 12 sitting on 12 thrones out there during the thousand year reign. The kingdom. Okay, the kingdom. The heavenly city, New Jerusalem. The kingdom on earth. All right, now let's go back to Acts 28. Questions there? <clears throat> All right, Acts 28. So verse 7. In the same quarters were possessions of the chief men of, man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. Gift of miracles is still going on. Gift of healings was there. Acts 28 is where we are. Okay, don't miss that. Matter of fact, verse 9, So when this was done, others also, which had diseases in the island, came and were healed. Yes, by Paul. Now we haven't seen a whole lot of this from Paul in the book of Acts, but it was going on. Now we know that later on, uh, so if we make this Acts 28, the end of the book of Acts. And then we know from Ephesians 3 that the dispensation of the grace of God, which is the mystery period, everything before this was still prophecy period. Everything after this, after the rapture of the church, is prophecy. Okay, the mystery, the dispensation of the grace of God. And again, Ephesians chapter 3 tells us all about that. So the prison epistles, after Acts 28, Paul goes to prison, and that's when he writes his prison epistles. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, okay, 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus and Philemon, the prison epistles, the seven books that he wrote after the book, after Acts 28, and we're going to come back and talk about that more when we get to the, the end of uh, Acts 28 here, okay, but during this time, Paul has lost the gift of healing, we know that, okay, from some of the things that he says. Okay, because he left some people sick. He couldn't heal some of the people that, um, some of the brethren that were preaching the word of God, preaching Paul's doctrine. He couldn't help them because that gift was no longer there. <clears throat> all right, so the end of verse 9, all these people were healed. 10, who also honored us with many honors, and when we departed, they laid at us with such things, such things as were necessary. And after three months... We departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the isle, whose sign was Castor and Pollux. And landing at Syracuse, we tarried there three days. A lot of detail in here. Paul, uh, Luke does a great job as a historian, even the book of Luke, of providing details, much like a historian, you know, reading, uh, uh, writing history. Yes, read the Bible as a history book. It is. Genesis through... Through Malachi, absolutely unfolds that way. The book of Acts, big time. And you see that transition. Verse 13, And from thence we fetched the compass, and came to Regium. And after one day the south wind blew, and we came the next day to Petioli. 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 That place. Works for me. To the pea city where we found brethren, and were desired to tarry with them seven days. Once again, seven days. You know the times all the way through here. And so we went toward Rome. That's where he's, his goal, right, is to get to Rome here. And from thence, when the brethren heard of us, they came to meet us as far as Apollo, Apollo Forum. And the three taverns, whom when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. 
And when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. But Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with the soldier that kept him. Okay, remember back there in 27, <coughs> in um, verse 2 or 3. He's assigned to centurion. One, Julius, a centurion of Augustus' band. 27.1, Julius was the one that was assigned to him. Okay? Uh, but Paul was suffered to dwell by himself uh, with the soldier that kept him. Verse 17 now. And it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. Okay? Who did he call? The chief of the Jews. It's still Jew first and also to the Greek. When he gets there, he calls the chief of the Jews. Went right to the top. And when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem unto the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, would have let me go, because there was no cause of death in me. But, not and, but, but when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar not that I had ought to accuse my nation of. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. Okay, make, you can't miss that. Paul is still, he's wanting Israel to get saved. Okay, he wants Israel to get saved. I have heard <coughs> some men preach that during the book of Acts, had Israel accepted the, the doctrine of the, the dispensation of the gospel of Christ. And had they accepted it, and had they all gotten saved and filled up the body of Christ immediately, we would have been right here. This period never would have happened. You know, I don't know if that's critical or not. I'm just telling you that um, the way Paul writes and some of the things he says in the books of Galatians and Thessalonians might lead you to believe that. Not, not critical because it didn't happen. So not a big deal. Okay. Okay, but he's still for the for the hope of Israel. I'm bound with this chain. We need to stop for a minute and go back. In particular, let's go back to the book of Romans, and we're going to really see just Paul's sense of urgency. Now, remember that the book of so we're here in, in uh, Acts 28. The book of Romans was written. Acts 20 and 21, right there at the end of Acts 20, beginning of Acts 21, is when the book of Romans was written there. Yeah, right at the beginning of, the, of Acts 20, I'm sorry. Let me make sure I've got that right there. So beginning of Acts 20 is where... The book of Romans is written. All right, now come back to uh, to Romans chapter nine. So this whole thing about Paul's um, desire for Israel. So I want you to see in Romans nine, Romans ten. Romans 11. Okay, see how he still has this urgency. Okay, so Romans 9, verse 1. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. That I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that, that, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren my kinsmen according to the flesh who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came who is over all God blessed forever Amen come down Okay, so come over to chapter 10 now. Chapter 10, verse 1. 
Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Come over to chapter 11. He's got this desire for Israel, his brethren. Chapter 11, verse 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Okay, Benjamin, those are, I mean, that's the tribe of tribes. Right, if you're the tribe of Benjamin... It's one thing to be a Jew or an Israelite, but man, to be in the tribe of Benjamin, I mean, you're, you're really there. Uh, verse 2. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. Watch ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he made intercession to God against Israel, saying, okay, let's, uh, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Okay, they haven't bowed to the image of Baal. And throughout the Old Testament, that was always, if, if there was one thing that God, I'll say, hated the worst, it was... It was the Jews turning to idols and worshiping idols, especially the kings that would lead the Jews to idol worship, to Baal worship. That's what he hated more than all. Okay? Uh, come down to, to verse 11. Romans chapter 11, verse 11. 11, 11. I wonder if there's any significance in the number 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid but rather, through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. There it is, to provoke the Jews to jealousy, if nothing else. Paul is absolutely still going to the Jews, still has this desire for the Jews. Remember, every place he went, Acts chapter 17, Paul, as his, you know, Paul went in unto the synagogue. Paul, as his manner was, went in unto the synagogue. Remember that? Back in Acts 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, every place he went, he was going into, because the promises were still, like back here in Genesis chapter 11, that guy named Abraham, I'll bless them that bless thee, I'll curse them that curse thee. And so the program started in Genesis chapter 11, and it continues right up until this time in Acts 28. Now Paul, so Peter and the twelve ha, are strictly to the Jews. Paul's going to the Jew first, and until they blaspheme, then he's going strictly to Gentiles through the book of Acts, right? Questions on that? Because that's important to catch. Remember, during the book of Acts, we have two churches going on. Okay, Peter and the Twelve start a church in Acts chapter 2. And that church, you know, Acts chapter 7, the stoning of Stephen, uh, and then you see everything transition to Paul very quickly. This church is gradually diminishing, as we are going to read in the next verse. Okay, it's diminishing. And when Paul gets saved in Acts chapter 9, he starts a new church, and it's gradually increasing to when we get to Acts 28 here, this is the only church, and this one's gone. It becomes, lo am I, not my people, Hosea. The Jews become lo am I at the end of Acts 28. I'm a few verses ahead of myself here. but So let's come back to Romans now and finish up. Verse 11 again. I say then, have they, the Jews, stumbled that they should fall? <coughs> God forbid... <coughs> Pardon me. God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke, provoke them, the Jews, to, to jealousy. What did you put in that water anyway? 
Now let the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office, if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, the Jews, and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? And on and on he goes there. I just want to make sure you see that Paul's desire absolutely is for his brethren, the Israelites, to be saved. But he also understands his office, verse 13, is so key. Eighteen times in the books of Romans to Philemon, eighteen times. Romans 2, Philemon, the doctrine which is for the church which is the body of Christ, as it's stated in Ephesians chapter 1 and in Colossians chapter 1, the church which is his body, the body of Christ. Romans to Philemon, 18 times he tells us what he tells us right here in verse 13 of chapter 11 of Romans. For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify mine office. Eighteen times he tells us that. He wrote 13 books out of the 27 books of the New Testament. Almost half. And yet most people miss the, doc the difference of the doctrine in Romans to Philemon. Paul is our apostle today. And today there is no difference between Jew and Gentile, as far as God Almighty is concerned, in our way into the church, which is His body. Prior to Acts chapter 9, the only way, all the way back to Genesis chapter 11, to Abraham, from Abraham to Acts chapter 9, the only way a Gentile could ever be saved, which was, was basically to the promise made back here to Abraham, bless them that bless thee, curse them that curse thee. A Gentile would have to bless Israel, would have to give alms to Israel, would have to follow the law, would have to become circumcised. They had to do everything they could to be like a Jew. Okay, And there probably weren't too many that were saved, but they could be. But that's how. Now, it's no longer through the Jews. We simply hear the gospel of Christ one day. We simply hear... That Christ, when he died on that cross, he died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried, took those sins to hell, and on the third day, God the Father raised him for our justification. It's belief and trust in the gospel of Christ. That's how we're saved today, whether we're Jew or Gentile. We don't have to go to a synagogue to hear the gospel of Christ preached. Matter of fact, we probably won't hear it there. But prior to Acts chapter 9, that's where you would have had to go to hear the gospel in place at that time. That's where you would have heard it preached, was at the synagogue. Okay? Back to Acts 28. Where's what time do you have, please? I have uh, 1045. Would you give me a... Yeah, thanks. Acts chapter 28. Okay, verse 20 again. The end, because for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. Acts 28, verse 20. Okay, I am bound with this chain for the hope, for the hope of Israel. He's still... It's like one last shot at Israel. Verse 21. And they said unto him, We neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee. But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest. For as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, 
and some believed not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed, after that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people, and say, Hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed, and had great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house, and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. The end of the book of Acts. The Jews have now become lo am I, not my people. Let's go back and see that. Yes, yes sir. Uh, okay, so in 24-25 and some believe in things which were spoken and some believed not and when they agreed not among themselves they departed at that point Paul wrote it off he said okay wrote it off that was that that's it that was your shot and so he followed with the law in mind exactly I'm going back to Hosea which is about six or six cities Right before the book of Joel, Hosea, chapter 1. It's right after Daniel and right before Joel. Tucked in between Daniel and Joel is Hosea. So a little bit after Isaiah, a little bit after Ezekiel. So Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea. It's a little tough back there. And also, they're all like two or three chapters or short books. Clean ones. <laughs> the clean pages. These are the real clean pages. But Hosea chapter 1. I just, I want you to see this thing about lo am I. You can always see it in scriptures. Everybody got it? Hosea chapter 1. Verse 9. Almost, okay, I heard an almost, so again, I want everybody to see it, so we're going to wait just a second there. After Daniel, before Joel, after Ezekiel, then Daniel. Page Yes. About a centimeter before the New Testament. So I guess if there's anybody from my friends at the other church, that all use the same Bible for this reason, so they can say page 976. There's validity to being able to say page 976. Is yours page 976? Mine's page. Yours isn't? Mine's, well, 977. Actually, it is 977 that this isn't. All right. Okay, page 977. Did that work? Got it. Okay. Hosea chapter 1 and verse 9 says, Then said God, Call his name Lo am I, for ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. There's a definition of Lo am I right there in Scripture, in your Bible. All right, let his name, call his name Lo am I, for ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. And that happens right here in Acts chapter 28, verse 28. Let's also go back to Acts now, chapter 9, when Paul first gets saved. Acts chapter 9, the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ unto Paul on the road to Damascus. Acts chapter 9, verse 3. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, okay, the appearing of Christ to Paul. 
Uh, Paul is saved. Then he's blinded for three days. And the Lord, in a vision now, the angel of the Lord appears unto Ananias. Okay, and there's uh, verse 10. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision. So in a vision, the Lord says unto Ananias. Okay, behold, I'm here. And on and on he goes. Uh, verse 13, Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard by many of this man, Paul, how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on his name. Now verse 15 is my verse. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he, Paul, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. The three distinctions of the ministry of Paul, the main being is being the apostle of and to the Gentiles. Okay, but it had to be offered first to the children of Israel. It was also offered to kings. And here we are in Acts 28. He's in front of the kings. Okay, we've seen that in 26, 27, 28. He's going right through the hierarchy of the Roman political government. Okay, he's in front of kings. And after this, after Acts 28, verse 31 concludes, it is all Gentiles. And that's why well, I'm going to put some numbers up here. Um, in a few minutes. Let's see. Actually, this is a good time to do that. There are two... two um, so, as we, where are we now time-wise? We've got about five minutes. Okay. And actually, we're probably going to go about five or ten after. I just wanted to... Uh, no one we're at that point, so thank you. About seven minutes. You know, Paul, all the time, starting back here with Abraham, okay, works was such a key word. It was always faith and works. Works were part of the program. In the future, in the trip period, it's faith and works. Out here, works are absolutely part of the program. In here... The church which is the body of Christ, it is strictly, it's faith, it's faith without the deeds of the law. Romans chapter 3. It is total salvation by grace. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now here's a couple things that are really interesting. In the book of Acts... The word grace shows up 24 times. 24 times just in the book of Acts. Showing this transition from the 12, the diminishing of them. Remember we read that in Romans 11? The diminishing of the Jews. And the increasing of the church, which is the body of Christ. I have that arrow. Oh, yeah. It looks like an arrow, but the body, that's where it started. body of Christ started in Acts 9. He says, in me first... So we'll just do that. So when we get to Acts 28, this is the only church, the church which is the body of Christ. This church becomes Loami, this church being the kingdom church at the 12 it started. Okay, it's diminished, it's now cut off. It's cut off at the end of Acts 28. It is total Loami. That church is done. And if you notice, that's pretty much about a generation from the crucifixion. Much like back here in Exodus, when a guy named Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt. And what happened? Right? When Moses goes up to get the Ten Commandments, what did they make while he was gone? A golden calf. And therefore, that generation for 40 years how, or, how long did they wander in the desert uh, uh, right 40 years 40 years they wandered in the desert right one generation had to die off before they could go into the promised land and look what happens right here after the cross 
for about 40 years, there's a church, I don't want to say wandering around because it stayed in Jerusalem. It never left Jerusalem. Okay, but it diminished in authority, in power. Matter of fact, after Acts chapter 15, you never even see any of the 12 apostles again. Really, after Acts 12, it's all about Paul and this transition from this church to this church. It's an absolute transition. So the word grace, 24 times in the book of Acts, introducing grace to us. 2 Corinthians has it 13 times. I'm sorry, not in the book of Acts, in the book of Romans, 24 times. Okay, in the book of Romans, the word grace is used 24 times. 2 Corinthians, it's used 13 times. Ephesians, 12 times. In the book of Acts, it's 10 times. Book of Romans, first book after Acts, and it's used 24 times. That's the introduction of grace to us. Isn't that something? How many times it's used in the book of Romans? 24 times. 13 times in 2 Corinthians, 12 in Ephesians, 10 times in the book of Acts. No other book of the Bible has it, more, has it in double digits. Pretty amazing. I want to grab one other counting of words. It's very significant. This whole transition from Jews to Gentiles. All right, in the book of Acts, the word Jews is used. Let's see, I don't even know how to do this. So I'll do it over here on the side. In the book of Acts, so we're going to look at the word Jew or Jews. Okay, just doing a word count. If you go into your esor.net and do a word count, how many times does the word Jew or Jews show up? In the book of Acts, it shows up 79 times. A lot of talk about Jew or Jews in the book of Acts. In the Acts epistles, so the book's written by Paul during the book of Acts. Let's go through those. So that would be Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, Galatians. Or let's go through it in the order they were written. Galatians, then 1st Thessalonians, then 2nd Thessalonians, then 1st Corinthians, then Romans, then 2nd Corinthians. In those books, the word Jew or Jews is used 29 times because Paul is going to the Jew first and also to the Greek and also to the Gentile. He always goes to the synagogue first, right? So there were six Acts epistles. There are seven prison epistles that are written after Acts 28, after the Jews become Loamite, not my people, Turn to the book of Colossians, chapter 3. This is where the Jews are after Acts 28 ends. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And for that matter, continues to this day in the year 2014. I'm going to jump into the middle of a, of a thought here, but... Starting in Colossians 3, verse 10. And have put on the new man. So it's all about the new man in Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Verse 11, where it says, where there is neither Jew, or where there is neither Greek nor Jew, that is the only time in the seven prison epistles that the word Jew or Jews is used. To show you that there is neither Jew nor Greek anymore. How about that? One time in the prison epistles is the word Jew or Jews used. And it's to say that there is no Jew today. After Acts 28. How about that? As they say, how do you like them apples? I mean, it's clear as can be. 
but yet it's one of the most misunderstood doctrines in, I'll say in Christianity, and, and when I say Christianity, I'll define that as those trying to follow God Almighty today. People that think, you know, there, you know, there's millions of people in churches today, and they're there because they want, I believe they're all there because they want to know God, they want to learn about God, they want to be saved. But yet this is one of the most misunderstood doctrines, and it's one of the most important doctrines. Why do we study according to 2 Timothy 2.15 that says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Why do we study according to that right there, rightly dividing the word of truth? Because the only thing that really matters, there's lots of doctrines in there, but either we're saved or we're not. Either I'm saved today or I'm not saved. And if I'm not and I get hit by a truck getting out there onto that street and die and I'm not saved, straight to hell. Okay? Same applies for everybody else in the world. Either they're saved or they're not. You either is or you ain't. There's no set. It was funny. Uh, Tuesday morning, I'm in a Bible study, and a guy. And we're doing a study of the Book of Ephesians. Praise the Lord. And one of the guys even asked, "Do you, is, do you get a second chance?" And he was meaning after you die, do you get a second chance? No. That's why we urge people. That's why the sense of urgency in preaching the gospel of Christ to others, in sharing the gospel with others. Because it is a moment in time. And we're either saved or we're not. We don't know when that last breath of life is. Naturally, unnaturally. You know, whether we... You know, Barry Hampton at 51 years, 50 or 51 years of age just went to sleep one night and didn't wake up the next day. I'm going to call that natural death. He had a lot of stuff going on, but, you know, he preached on a Wednesday night, went to sleep at 50 years of age. I'm a week, he's a week younger than I am. So I guess that made it 51, whatever it was, you get the idea. His son at nine years of age, backing out of the driveway. Terrible collision. Wright didn't even have the car in drive yet. Bam! Two cars hit him. Well, one car hit him. Two cars racing at 90 miles an hour through their neighborhood. One hits her car and two people in her car breathe their last breath, one of which was his nine-year-old son. We don't know when our last breath is. We might have a fire in our house at 3 o'clock in the morning. Praise the Lord, sometimes we wake up, but sometimes people don't. We don't know when that last breath is. That's a sense of urgency in preaching the gospel. Much like the analogy of a house on fire. And by the way, in case you're uh, making an analogy, you know, the Gregory's went through this. Their house at three in the morning, but praise the Lord, somebody in the house, house woke up and woke everybody else up and got them out just in time because it wasn't much later, right? In that house? 30 seconds later? After we got out. I think 30 seconds later for the camera, the house collapsed. 30 seconds. Now, if your neighbor's house was on fire like that, think about it. You know, preaching the gospel to people. Well, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it next week. I don't want to offend anybody. If your, if your house was on fire and you were still sleeping and your neighbor was up getting a glass of milk, whatever, and saw your house on fire, do you want him coming over? Tapping on your door lightly. I don't want to offend them. They might be sleeping. I mean, you know, you get the idea. Hey, your house is on fire. It's a same. I mean, obviously, the sense of urgency is there literally. But we don't know. That's a busy road out there. We don't know when our last time is. As a matter of fact, when we went to the first Bible conference, it was three weeks after Barry's nine-year-old son was killed in that accident. We happened to be going to a Bible study down in Pensacola, and we had about a 10, 12-hour drive to get there. We were living in North Carolina at the time. And we're driving three times. How many of you ever seen a, a helicopter come to an accident? You know, the jaws of life, helicopter, medical helicopter come to an accident so they can load somebody. Have you ever seen that in real person? 
Yeah, life flight, lifeline, life flight, life flight, whichever. Uh, how many of you have seen that in person, not just on the news? One person in here has seen it in person. We saw it not once on the way from North Carolina to that conference, not once, not twice, but three different accidents in that single day's drive. From North Carolina to Pensacola, three different accidents it had. We saw the helicopter in all three cases. I don't think I've seen one since. <laughs> Crazy. 2001 was the year. 2000 or 2001 was the year. I haven't seen one since. I saw three in one day. You think we didn't have some good conversations with our kids that, those, that trip? And then we get there, and there's Brother Barry there. and gave one of the most unbelievable talk, uh, sermons. I'll call it, I've ever heard. He was able to say, I can now stand here in front of you and say I have such a better appreciation for what God the Father went through on this day. Remember when the Lord Jesus Christ says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? His Father, right? Why hast thou forsaken me? His God the Father had to turn His Son, turn His back on His Son because he saw the sin. Yeah. My sin. Your sin. The sins of the world. Were all placed on him. In him. Christ. He who knew no sin. Became sin for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we'll end with this. What the ministry of Paul was all about. 18 times he tells us. He's the apostle to the Gentiles. Eleven times he presents the gospel of Christ. The term gospel of Christ is in Romans to Philemon. Ele uh, ten, eleven times. Ten or eleven times. It's never before Romans. It's never after Philemon. The term the gospel of Christ. But ten or eleven times it's in Romans to Philemon. As he says in Romans chapter 1. You don't stay in 2 Corinthians 5. Romans chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, he says, So, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you there at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it, the gospel of Christ, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. First time you see gospel of Christ right there. First book written by Paul, Romans, right after the book of Acts, written by Paul that shows up in Scripture. And there he says it, right out of the chute. It's the power of God unto salvation. He's the apostle to the Gentiles. That's the gospel he brought. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. To wit, I'm talking about the crucifixion here. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we, and put yourself right here, we are ambassadors for Christ. Be an ambassador for Christ, I implore you. Be that ambassador for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For He, God, hath made Him Christ. To be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Praise the Lord. That's the ministry of the Apostle Paul right there. He's the one that revealed all of this to the world through the letters that he wrote. The 13 letters that are almost half of the New Testament. <coughs> and yet it's the most misunderstood doctrine going on today, this morning in the churches across America, is who this man Paul was, what his ministry was, to whom it was, and why it's different. And I'm going to say why it's better than the doctrine that the Twelve rolled out. It is total faith without the deeds of the law. It is total grace. There is nothing we can do to gain our salvation there is nothing we can do to lose our salvation. We have been reconciled to God, whether we know it or not. There's a moment when we go from belief to trust. We believe the historical facts 
of the gospel of Christ, that he died. And the, the historical facts would be that he died, was buried, and rose again. Trusting is when we go to, oh yeah, when he died, he died, those three key words, for our sins. The gospel of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 is where you find it. How he died for our sins, according to the scriptures, was buried and raised again for our justification. The moment we trust in that, Ephesians 1.13 says, we're saved and we're sealed unto the day of redemption. Out here, the rapture of the body of Christ. The calling out of the body of Christ, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That's why it matters what Paul said. All right, it's been a great study of the book of Acts. And, um, hey, if you missed any of them, go back on the recordings. And uh, we'll take a 15-minute break and see you then.